Coffee in Dublin, morning for me. Ooh, Camp Canberra. I know where I'd rather be. Sun is shining in Edinburgh. Great. Oh, yeah. Nice Dundrum. It's not shining here in Donovan, I can tell you. It's pretty grey and dull. Athen Rye. Okay, so we might start now in a moment. There's uh, about 40 people here. Um, if people keep coming in throughout, that's fine. We don't mind. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. And um, pretty Graham, I'll hi too, yeah. Uh, and if you want to mute your mics unless you're speaking, that'd be great. Uh, if you have questions, throw them into the chat. Um, and we'll have a bit of a Q&A session at the end. So if you want to come in by, by mic, then that, that's perfectly great. Uh, we have a great lineup today. We're, we're delighted to have Catherine Cronin from the National Forum giving us a keynote talk. And then we'll, we're going to introduce you to the guide. Uh, and then after that, we're having a small panel, a short panel, because we want to try and keep it to an hour, because we reckon people have enough Zoom time these days. So I'm just going to share my slides. Um, James or Lorraine, you might just send Eamon the Zoom link. I see an, a message for him there. So there's a hashtag for, for the launch today, hashtag go open. If you feel like tweeting, please go ahead. Um, before I forget, I should also thank the National Forum and also the DCU Teaching Enhancement Unit for, for funding this project through the SATL funding. Um, so we're delighted to receive that. Um, so it's a lovely mixed team that, that you know, have contributed to this project a combination of uh, DCU Library, DCU Open Education, and the Digital Learning Design Unit. So our web address is there, dculibguides.com forward slash go open. So we'll continue to add to that resource after the, after the life of the project. Um, and also the recording of this session and any resources and slides will go on uh, there too. Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Catherine Cronin, Dr. Catherine Cronin from the National Forum, a uh, prestigious open educator, open researcher, um, and really one of the, the big Irish and international names in the area of open education. So I'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to you, Catherine, if That's you want to get kind. your slides ready. Thank you, Orna. Yes, I'll share my screen. Okay, make that full screen. Uh, is that visible okay? Okay, that's great. Um, thank you so much. And before I start, I'll just say apologies. I have a little bit of um, hay fever this morning, so, um, but I'll do my best to talk through that. Um, I'm really grateful for the invitation to come this morning. I, um, I've, I've seen the Go Open Guide, really impressed with what you've done, and particularly that it's a collaboration across so many different uh, functions um, at the university, uh, which really bodes well for, you know, for it being effective you know, across mm -hmm. the board, students and staff, and not just at DCU, but probably beyond as well. Um, so often when we talk about open education, we talk about um, the nuts and bolts of it, like the licenses and OER and how we share and so on. But I just thought I'd start today just with kind of the big picture um, and this is uh, a quote from Brigitte Vezina and Cable Green from Creative Commons uh, from, from an article called Education in Times of Crisis and Beyond. And really uh, pointing out that all of our efforts, our collective efforts um, in open education, you know, are not a short term fix, um, but really a long term solution to ensuring equitable and inclusive access to education. For as many people as possible. So, you know, I see what we're doing in the National Forum and what you're doing at DCU is, is very complementary um, in terms of, you know, ensuring that um, equity and inclusion, uh, are, as I said, across the board. So, UNESCO is one of the leaders, has been one of the leaders in open education for quite some time. And just almost exactly a year ago, they published this call 
for joint action. So it was the early days of the COVID crisis. Um, and they pointed out that we're at a pivotal moment in history. You know, and I often find myself saying, you know, both personally, and I think probably true for many of us, that whatever we may have known or understood about inequality before March of 2020, we certainly know a lot more now, um, both in terms of education and in broader society. So UNESCO really addressed that and linked it to um, the potential of open education. Um, and they called on educators. So it was very much a call to us um, as, as educators to support the use of open educational resources for sharing learning and knowledge openly worldwide with a view to building, again, more inclusive, sustainable and resilient knowledge societies. So all of these efforts of, of ours are, you know, are contributing to a greater whole. And I know that um, a lot of people here will, will know, you know, what we are um, is already, um, but I, I know this is an introductory session, so I'm just including some basic definitions um, before we start. Um, so open educational resources, again, defined by UNESCO, are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium. They don't have to be digital, although they, quite often they, they are, um, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license. I bolded the keywords here. Um, and that open license permits no cost access, use, um, adaptation, and redistribution by others um, with limited or no restrictions. So um, OER are, are essentially about improving teaching and learning. Uh, and they're not just, the important point here, I suppose, is that they're not just free resources, but they're generally um, considered you know, free resources with permissions. Um, and these are the permissions, David Wiley, describes them as these five R's, uh, the permissions of, of OER. So this presentation, for example, is an OER. I sent or, or another link. I don't know if you put it in the chat or in a, but you, you might do that if you don't mind. I meant to do it at the start. So my presentation is openly licensed. So that's just an example um, of an OER. So this presentation or anything that you encounter um, that has uh, an OER license, you can generally retain it for yourself, reuse it in your own context, adapt, modify, and improve it for your own context, remix it uh, with other materials. So um, remixing it to, to suit your students, you know, your community, your needs, um, and redistribute it with others. So even this slide is an example of what, how I've done that. So I included that image of, um, of the OER, lovely OER image from Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, and then that's David Wiley's work, the, the five R's. So this is an example of just how you can reuse and remix open educational resources, you know, for your own, uh, for your own teaching and communication. So the open licenses, uh, these uh, typically creative commons licenses are widely used in education, which is uh, of course about sharing, but they're also used increasingly in other organizations. So the National Forum openly licenses everything that we <clears throat> publish as does the European Commission, the Wellcome Trust, many research funding bodies, as you probably know. Um, and there's an incre increasing examples of open licensing in cultural heritage collections. These are two examples, uh, the Smithsonian Institute and the Rijksmuseum, which was one of the leaders in this, who have openly licensed um, their collections. Um, so these are amazing resources that are available for us and our students to use, to engage with, again, to remix, you know, to use in learning, teaching and assessment. But just like, um, as you say, open education itself is not just about the content. Um, so open education is not just about open education resources. And there's this larger concept of OEP, as it's called, open educational practices. And that is what's enabled uh, kind of pedagogically when we use OER um, in teaching and learning. So this kind of umbrella concept of OEP includes, you know, the use, reuse, and creation of OER, but also, um, as it says here, collaborative pedagogical practices, um, employing generally social media and open web tools for interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation and sharing, and ultimately empowerment of learners. And I'll share a few examples just uh, to, to kind of get your hands around, you know, how some people um, have done this if you don't already practice it yourself. So the question I posed at the start was why open education in higher education? So just a little more specifically, I'd like to just give some examples of why open for teaching and learning. Um, and generally we say that um, open education has potential benefits in these three areas, and that is access, equity, and pedagogy. 
So the first, of course, is access. And that's usually the, the, the place that most people see the benefits immediately when we talk about open educational resources. So for example, in a teaching situation, if we share resources for a module that we're teaching as OER, um, then students have access to those materials you know, at no cost. Teachers who might have found themselves teaching online for the first time, perhaps um, a year ago, um, have a vast, you know, uh, there's a vast amount of openly licensed teaching and learning materials already available um, that, again, can be adapted, reused, uh, and so on. And then beyond that, you know, this is really an issue kind of for publicly funded universities and, and institutions, particularly. Um, we, by sharing our um, educational content openly, you know, using open license, anyone um, with an internet access and the knowledge and skills required can access that content. So, um, you know, students, um, those who teach and anyone in, in the communities, you know, we live and work in and so on. The second aspect where there's potential value is the, is the area of equity. So obviously reducing costs for students um, is, is an equity issue. You know, we know, for example, during the COVID crisis, you know, that many students, um, had already been experiencing financial hardship and the COVID crisis exacerbated that. So reducing costs for students is obviously, you know, incredibly important. Another perhaps more hidden advantage of using open educational resources as um, teaching and learning resources is the persistent availability of them. So they don't require access codes. Um, they're not only available when you have a university email. So again, students have access to OER before their students during the time that they're students and beyond that. So if they take any breaks in study or so on, they have access to those materials. Um, the third bullet there is just is an enormous one. There's, a, there's an awful lot of work going on here at the moment around di addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the materials. So you know, we've all used um, textbooks or other materials where, that weren't quite on the mark in terms of being inclusive, say, of Irish um, examples or examples that represent our students and particularly marginalized um, identities. You know, women aren't often included. Sometimes the language is all masculine pronouns. Um, LGBTQ identities, race, being racially inclusive, you know, all these different ways that sometimes existing educational materials are not inclusive. When the materials are open, we can change that. We can include perspectives that might be missing uh, to make them more inclusive. And overall, again, supporting sustainable development goal number four, which is part of what we're, we're all about in terms of um, lifelong learning for all. And finally, and you know, we could spend the whole hour talking about um, how, how open enables open pedagogy and you know, open educational practices. These are just some of the ways. So again, we can adapt and use OER in context for our students, you know, for our modules, for our disciplines, for our communities. Students can co-create OER. So co-creating open textbooks, for example. Um, a whole array of ways of authentic assessment. A lot of people are talking about authentic assessment these days. This has been something that has been practiced within open education for many years. So there are so many examples of how to do this. Students creating OER, for example, um, and sharing with their communities and public audiences as a form of assessment, contributing to public knowledge, developing digital literacies in the process, developing digital literacies, data literacies, copyright literacies. Again, that stand them in good stead to be, you know, um, well, well versed digital citizens beyond the time that they're students. Uh, diversity, diversifying the curriculum, as I said, and then a whole host of ways that we thin the walls of the classroom and enable different kinds of local and global collaboration when we use open practices. So, um, how is my time, Orna? Because I can go quickly through these examples here. Do a grand, Catherine. Okay. <laughs> You're setting the scene very nicely. Okay, great. Um, I just have uh, three, four examples of um, how educators have used OER and OEP, just to kind of, again, set the scene for, for, for the work that you are introducing today. The first is co-creating open textbooks. So this is engaging students, not just us as educators sourcing open textbooks, engaging students perhaps in creating those textbooks. So a beautiful project from the University of Cape, Cape Town called dot for d Digital Open Textbooks for Development, um, explains that using open textbooks isn't just about 
giving content to students, um, but empowering academics to build curricula in a more relevant fashion, giving marginalized voices expression, and giving students power over how knowledge is created, how knowledge is created rather, to transform universities. Um, the, uh, a lovely example, the first one there is cost is usually the main focus when we're thinking about open textbooks. And the City University of New York, which has been described as um, diverse in every way except socioeconomically, um, that you know most of the students at the City University uh, of New York are marginalized socioeconomically. They actually advertise in their course catalog um, ZTC OER course sections or modules, so zero textbook costs. So they give students that information up front so that if students, you know, if that's an issue for students, um, that they can actually choose to enroll in a course that has no costs to, for textbooks. Um, so they, they're, again, they're, they're leaders in this area in terms of um, zero textbook costs. Um, uh, Robin DeRosa is another person who's done a, a great deal of work in, in open education and particularly open textbooks. And she describes how she started creating open textbooks for students, you know, again, driven by the cost issue, but found that the pedagogical benefits to students were beyond measure, that that ended up being rare, where really it was very valuable. Um, the second example is student created OER. Um, some of you might have been at um, National Forum webinar in October, Bonnie Stewart as a guest speaker and she shared this example. She's um, teaching trainee teachers. So these are gonna be K to 12 teachers, her students. And she had them look at all the different kinds of social media tools that they might use for creating community with their students. So Zoom and Padlet and um, loads of others. And instead of just having them create something that was written or sharing within their community, they created short YouTube videos and created a collection of these. So they, that was their assessment. So they demonstrated their knowledge. They shared the resource, not just with their community, but with any, anyone, any educator or teacher anywhere, because um, these are open educational resources. Lovely example. Um, uh, and Still We Rise, uh, another wonderful example, students co collaboratively co-creating OER. These were students um, at the State University of New York in Plattsburgh who researched, designed, and built um, an exhibition in their library called And Still We Rise. Uh, some of you will know this from Maya Angelou poem. And it was an exhibit on prominent Black political and cultural figures who had visited the college. It's, it's an old university. Um, and they, students worked with their teachers and with librarians to look at the college's archives and secondary sources, and they created an openly licensed digital and physical exhibit. So again, this was an OER assignment, but they created something that's long lasting um, and contributed to the community, not just the college community, but the wider community. Um, and finally, um, creating and editing Wikipedia articles. Ewan McAndrew is probably the person I quote most in, in talking about uh, editing Wikipedia. He's the Wikimedia in residence at the University of Edinburgh. And he says, don't cite Wikipedia, write Wikipedia. So really let's, let's engage in teaching our students about how Wikipedia is authored and have them apply their scholarly knowledge to a public resource that's used by millions of people. So again, all of these things are linked in the presentation if you want to follow up on them. I don't think I need to say more there, but uh, I know you have some people at DCU who, who are doing this work as well. Um, finally, to wrap up, just a few resources that I just want to leave you with. I won't um, talk about them um, in any detail. Some of the examples that I just shared are in these collections. So Open at the Margins um, is a collection of you know, gray literature, if you like. Um, it's got blog posts and conference presentations by people who, uh, who um, have really been digging into these critical perspectives and how open education can be used for equity and social justice. Um, the Open Pedagogy Approaches was co-authored by students, teachers, and librarians uh, from New York, State University of New York. And Still We Rise example came from this collection. Um, and finally, a special issue of JIME, which came out last year about open education and social justice. All of these were published in last year, all current examples. And because they're created by open educators, feel free to contact them. They would only love you know, to, to speak with you more if you're thinking about reusing um, their work. So those are international examples. National examples, the National Forum has a couple of guides um, about OER and OEP and how to license. And the, the example on the left is just a new digital resource we published last month. 
about understanding OER and OEP. All of them are available on this page. But these form just a strand of the support network that's required. And ideally, you know, any practitioner, student, staff, um, uh, senior manager would have individual local support. And that's where I see um, the work that you've done um, at DCU as kind of leading that way. So um, the, I, I often use this example to, to point out the kind of support that's required if we really want to embed openness in teaching and learning. So from the upper left over to the right, you know, we need to be able to support individual, an individual student, an individual lecturer who's thinking about using these practices and widening it a bit. Maybe let's think about working within programs, within disciplines, within institutions, and then more widely looking at things like open policy and so on. So um, I see that Go Open includes many of these strands because it's situated in your institution. It's relating to your practice um, uh, as a scholarly um, community. Um, it's about sustainability. And you know, all of the people I know who have been involved in Go Open are, are partnering and leading you know, nationally and internationally in terms of open education. So um, to conclude, I just wanted to say that you know, personally, as someone who's, who's deeply committed to openness and open education, but also as a representative of the National Forum, I'm just so thrilled to see the collaborative approach that you took. Um, and we, would re we really want to continue to collaborate and learn with you. Um, as you make a difference to, to teaching and learning and lives uh, at DCU and beyond. So really happy to be here and happy to join the discussion today. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was a really great talk. Uh, if you want to give her a clap hands symbol or if you want to unmute and clap either, um, you really set the scene. And thank you very much for those supportive words. Um, one thing I think we realized when we came up with this idea for this project on the plane on the way home from a conference where all good ideas come from, mm -hmm. myself, Lorraine and James had been at an open education conference and where we learned at that conference that there was a lot of mixed teams working together on this. So uh, librarians, academics, learning technologists um, and different disciplines involved too. Uh, and that kind of inspired us uh, to, to, to go for the funding for this project. Um, but I think you're right. I think the different, the collaborative part of this project is, is one of its strengths. So thank you for setting the scene and for, for the, the kind words of support and inspiration. Um, I'm going to just introduce the guide now, very briefly. Um, so the guide is two things. There's the a PDF version. So that's on Zenodo, which is a very nice open platform that you can publish anything. It's Creative Commons licensed. It's very much designed to be a baby steps beginner's guide. Because one of the things I found when I was delving into open education, an area I've been attracted to for a long time, because I, I believe in, in the concept of open knowledge, was that it had an awful lot of terminology and Technical, technical things around licensing, and I found that a bit overwhelming. So I thought, uh, and others too, that simple baby steps, how do I get started? Even in a very small way uh, with open education, you know, there was a gap there. So the guide itself, the PDF version, uh, uh, and also the lib guide is centered around five questions. What is open education? What are open teaching and learning practices? What is Creative Commons license, licensing and how do I use it? What are OER? And how do I find and use open resources? And in each section, it gives a definition, a very short synopsis of some of the literature, and then examples and resources and ways for you to go a little bit further in your practice. Um, so that's the uh, PDF version. There's also a LibGuide version um, which Victoria is going to talk about now. I'll just give you a look at that. And there's the web address. So the idea is this one is a living document. We can add to this. Um, and that's the way it, you know, it's, it ensures the sustainability of the project. Also, you know, if, if people come to us and say, oh, I'm really interested on, in this, we can develop further resources. Also, we'll put the recording and the slides from this webinar today on here, and they will also be an open resource. Um, so 
that's hosted on the DCU library website as well. So I think that that helps as well towards us keeping it going and keeping it up to date and adding to it. Um, so Victoria, do you want to give a bit more detail there? I can, I will share my screen. Hopefully, let's see. No, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Okay. So basically, as, as regards the LibGuide, um, DCU Library, we've had a LibGuides account and therefore been part of the LibGuides community for a number of years. And those of you familiar with LibGuides will know that the sharing of content within the community is encouraged whenever you publish a guide. So the default is actually set to share with community. So unless you expressly say not to, uh, guides, pages, and ind individual boxes and content items within guides can all be copied and adapted. We've gone a step further with this Go Open Guide, licensing all content with a Creative Commons 4.0 license. So we're making it fully open to all who wish to retain, reuse, remix, revise, and redistribute um, for their own purposes. Uh, we're certainly not the first to create a LibGuide on the subject of open educational practice. Maynooth, NUIG, AIT and UCD, to name but a few, have all published on aspects of going open. Our LibGuide mirrors the structure and content of the guide we're launching today with a few added extras. Unlike the PDF, as Orna said, the LibGuide is a live document and we intend to keep it updated to reflect the ongoing changes in this area. And as well as Orna also said, we've really created it as a quick go-to resource just for anybody looking to join in this conversation. The LibGuides platform allows us to embed media content. So we've made this another access point for some of the wonderful resources created by the National Forum. For example, their ongoing webinar series. We've also included a couple of nice infographics that don't appear in the PDF. Uh, the guide walks you through the concept of open education open teaching and learning practices with some examples before addressing open educational resources. What they are, how to license OER you've created in a way that embraces the principle of the five R's. There's also a section on how to create accessible OER according to the Universal Design for Learning Framework, as well as an explainer of the advantages of using OER in your own educational practice. The section, how do I find and use open resources, so not just open educational resources, outlines where to find them, how to evaluate them, because as we all know, that is important. Um, examples of where you might use open resources, as well as suggestions on where you might share those you've created or reused. So for example, the simple act of sharing on social media platforms or in repositories like GitHub, Zenodo, OER Commons and the OER world map. Finally, the downloadable resources page was a nice one we were able to add into the LibGuide with links to all the relevant files for images used both in the LibGuide and in the PDF, and obviously the link to the, P the, download to the PDF as well. So there is the link to the LibGuide and you're of course welcome to have a look. So back to you, Orna. Let me start. Thanks, Victoria. And there's some nice extra goodies in there. We made everything. I think I, I like that. So we made everything downloadable, all the images, everything, you name it, and shareable. Um, and there's some good, good images in there as well. Um, so we're, we're pleased with that. Um, so we're going to move to the, the panel portion of the session. We're doing pretty well on time for a change. Um, um, and so just before I introduce the panel, two, two of the images from the guide there, which I think are, 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 I think they're beautiful, four reasons to go open and four ways to go open. So, you know, very much um, speaking to what Catherine was speaking about, about the reasons and then the ways as well. So we're gonna pick those up in the panel discussion. Um, so I'll introduce the panel, Catherine Cronin, obviously, um, from the National Forum. Uh, Ellen Breen from DCU Library and Eamon Costello from Open Education and James Brunton also from Open Education, conveniently named for this, uh, this panel discussion. 
So we're, we're going to have three questions and we're just going to go around each, each person in turn and just have a little brief chat about that question. So the first question is, how did you get involved with open education? So I'll go to you, Catherine. I'm, I'm hoping there's a good story there. Oh, I suppose there's a, there's a number of stories, but um, I would say the overarching reason is just as someone who was teaching, I was teaching in the, in the IT discipline in NUI Galway in the 2000s and up to about 2014. And I became aware of resources that um, other people were sharing that I was able to use, you know, in my own teaching. So I just began to just understand just through my engagement on Twitter and through other networks, there were MOOCs going on and open courses going on and people sharing a practice, not just sharing resources, but how they did particular things and why they, they, they did them. And through those open resources, people sharing their reflections and open blogs, I realized the whole, this whole concept of the commons that I was able to benefit from so many of these open resources. And the only way that works is if then you share your own practice back in again. So I just started with baby steps, you know, just really teaching, you know, starting to teach openly. I, I used Twitter with my students. I, I put my whole course on a, on a WordPress blog so that what we were doing was visible. I never required my students to be open practitioners, but I tried to model open practice um and and kind of the affordances of open practice in my teaching and then because i became so committed to it and realized that like the approach that you have is very systemic and institutional but with that without that um, you can only go so far as an individual practitioner so um, i decided that if i i would do my uh, phd in the area of open educational practices which i did in the mid 20 teens <clears throat> finished 2018 um, so that I could work more in the area of policy and, you know, systemic, a systemic approach to open education. And then I came to work for the National Forum to, um, to do just that. Uh, try and influence it at a higher level. Yeah, and through collaboration, you know, because it's all through collaboration, but yes. And it's interesting that Twitter is a big feature as well. I do think Twitter is, is big among that community. It is, and, and um, you know, Twitter's evolved. Anyone who's been involved in Twitter for many years will know that, you know, it used to be a little bit more small and edgy, you know, it's gotten more, you know, brands and public and, you know, inflammatory things, but, you know, there's still, a, there's still a strong education and open education community on Twitter. Mm. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Uh, over to you, James. How did you first get involved with open education? Um, I suppose really the start of it was starting to work in DCU in 2010 on um, open education, open access undergraduate programs. And I suppose it was actually it was before 2010, if I really think about it, because I was a part time uh, online tutor for that same unit when I was doing my PhD in the mid noughties. So, you know, there I really started to see it didn't take long for me to see the benefits that, that this open access entry policy and a program with flexible progression, what this did for people, the people who otherwise would not have been able to pursue their educational goals, you know, now were able to do that. You know, they were able to tailor their education to their lives, you know, and that, that otherwise they basically would be not able to do that at all. So, you know, that was the big thing. So I suppose I started from the big end, which might be unusual for some people, Oh no, you've frozen a bit, James. Some 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 internety weird stuff People going on there. See other game my unity. I okay, James. We might come back to you because you you've frozen. Um, over to Ellen now. Coming from the library side of the house, how did you get into open education? Lorna, um, good morning, everybody. Um, well, obviously, working in, in a library, um, an academic library, and as a librarian, we've been involved in the open environment, I guess, the open agenda, the broader open agenda, for a long, long time, particularly in relation to open access to research. But in terms of open education, it's interesting, it's 10 years since I and colleagues in DCU Library were involved in an OER project, which was actually funded by the then National Digital Learning Resource Service. 
and we got 10k funding to develop um, an open access toolkit to support our blended approach to training across um, institutions to bibliometrics training for research students. And, and just thinking back, um, we actually developed 70 OER, up, I think it was roughly up to 70 OER. The main, the main OER was a digital tutorial, an online digital tutorial, but there were lots of um, worksheets, lesson plans as well um, in that toolkit. So that was the kind of our first thing, but I think as um, Catherine said earlier, the big takeaway from that initiative was the cross institutional sharing of our expertise um, and working with colleagues across um, other libraries. And they were UCD, um, Maynooth University, TU Dublin and ourselves. So that was 10 years ago, yeah. Wow, that's a long time in, in, in education terms. And of course we, we used re reusable learning objects, but then that was the term we used um, however, when, when you think about the five um, retain, remix, we use all our resources where you know where where they are now. They, they were that you can define them as OER in that context. The five ORs. You were bleeding edge, and and yeah, no <laughs> no one really talks about ORLOs anymore, do they? Or reusable learning objects? But but it, you're, you're yeah. right. It's it's kind of this. Was that the NDLOR, Ellen? Yeah, that was. The, uh, yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, that, that had its own repository but there were issues with that and, and um i know it was quite complex using that repository um, the actual my my ori has uh, resources still going and it was it's been maintained and it is available on the connell website the consortium of national university libraries so having those resources on websites on those repositories that were mentioned earlier um work yeah. great and that sustainability question is still still a challenge Exactly, and it was then, and um, yeah, certainly, it, it's a it's a good question, actually. Yeah. Thanks, Al. And over to Eamon, I think he can relate to your NDLOR st story, if I'm remembering his background right. So how did you get started, Eamon? Well, I yeah, I, I, the NDLR, I was in the NDLR, um, but I, I, I took a course with something called OSCO back in the 90s, in the late 90s. And um, we have some graduates actually of the Open Education Unit or OSCOL, I think on the, in the chat, they might, the participants might, some alumni, August alumni might like to comment because like that's a, an important part. And then I, I started working here in DCU in OSCOL and, and the Open Education Unit subsequently. And um, I went to a conference in the UK and I realized, oh my God, there's this whole tradition of open universities out there and they're doing this amazing stuff and I'm a part of that this is this is wow and that's a kind of other open we didn't maybe get into and it but that James alluded to um and it goes back to the uh 18th century uh the society for the advancement of women in in the US was one of the, the the kind of first uh access to university education for women there started by a woman um and similar University of London had similar programs back in 1850 something. Um, but, and that was for advanced, that was for access for women and, and minority groups, uh, racial groups to, to higher ed. I was involved in the NDLR and I would dispute your contention about, or I think this, we could reframe the NDLR as some kind of fail thing that didn't, I think it was transformative. It was a huge success story. And the success is seen in things like the forum in terms of this launch, in terms of the literacy in the sector around Creative Commons and licensing. That simple fact, people know what licensing is now. And the NDLR, like the resources are gone, but the knowledge is, is still there in, in people. So, and I guess around maybe one third um, type of open, uh, I was involved in around 2005 or so. And around 2005, six, I'd say, just around the time when maybe, and Catherine is a very good scholar of this, she's written great, great um, pieces about it, the, the history of open educational practice. And it wasn't maybe even called that back then, or it was on the cusp of it. And I was editing Wikipedia with students. And this was good fun, just because it was nice to, to hack something really. I wasn't really connected up to anything else. And we were doing this one, Porter's Five Forces. Ronan will know this as a good, uh, business uh, business uh, uh, person, but we we're doing this Porter's Five Forces model 
So I said, how would Wikipedia use Porter's five forces to see how, Wiki how the encyclopedia market could be disrupted by Wikipedia? And we're to go in and edit the five forces uh, article yourself. And then the Irish government, in its wisdom, decided to go out and purchase a bunch of DVDs of Encyclopedia Britannica for schools, even though there was this great thing called Wikipedia that we were literally editing. <laughs> and I think the lesson for me was that it's kind of weird. People want to spend money on education sometimes. And it's like, if you don't spend money on it, if it's free, it's not worth anything. Um, so I think the idea of just getting this stuff out there and um, the idea of free is not necessarily open, but that's three, that's three things of how I got involved in Open Arna. That was a lot, Eamon. But, but I, I look, no, it's great. But I, I, the open, the university, the open university uh, history there is really interesting. The distance one as well, like the Open University UK is a great example of that too. Um, okay, so on to the next question. It's again, a bit of a big one. Uh, so why do you think open education is important? So go back to Catherine. Okay, this is easy because this is what I think about all the time. And um, I mean, it's, you know, access, equity and pedagogy is, is, is the simple answer. Um, what that means uh, for individuals, for institutions, you know, for different countries is different. So, you know, when we talk about marginalized communities, you know, that means something different, perhaps, you know, at DCU or in Ireland than it might mean in New York or um, Canada or South Africa or whatever. But these are the things that we need to think about. And as I said, particularly when we, you know, many of us work in publicly funded institutions and, you know, uh, what is the value of education, is it the stuff that we produce or is it the educational experience? So we don't lose anything by sharing, you know, content. Uh, in fact, you know, the value as, as many people said, the value increases as we share it, you know, others can use it, others can adapt it. And by so doing, we open up opportunities for people, we open up opportunities for collaboration, for much richer, pedagogy, richer forms of assessment. So yes, we provide opportunities for, you know, for individuals who might not have them otherwise, but we also enhance the, the, the experience of learning and teaching and assessment for, you know, for those of us who are engaged in it. And as I said, I think, you know, with, with the pandemic we've just experienced with, you know, environmental sustainability issues with so many things, you know, the only way we solve these complex problems is, and wicked problems indeed, is together. Um, and, you know, openness provides the means by which we can do that better than any other way, you know, that I've seen. So I think it's the future really. You've sold me, Catherine. Uh, same question to you, James, and hopefully the, yeah, the hopefully broadband the, will be kind. Hopefully the broadband will be kind. Wave at me if, if, if I start to go down. I mean, Catherine's, how could you follow that answer really but i i would just talk about uh lowering barriers you know that's what open education can do and that can be again at the wide end like i was talking about earlier lowering barriers into education and through education um and then it can be more on a meso and micro level you know lowering barriers for students by moving to an open textbook rather than them having to pay 60 euro or 100 euro or 400 euro for a textbook you know uh, sharing sharing your lesson plan with other educators to lower the barrier for them to produce their lesson plan sharing you know if you make a resource uh put a cc license on it and share it you're lowering the barrier for everyone around you you're becoming more collaborative you know um and the only other thing i think i think is connected to the next question so i'm just going to stop there <laughs> thanks james um so same question to you ellen yeah, um, yeah, it's hard to follow follow those um, because I, I'm a strong believer as, as the library community is in open and the benefits of open for all and for society. Um, in the context of, I suppose, of what we're doing on the ground in terms of librarians and their teaching and developing students' information literacy and digital 
skills. I think it's really, really important because we we develop them in, in terms of enhancing their experience whilst they're with us in, in university, but it equally looking out to lifelong learning opportunities and that they have those skills to then navigate the world, the digital world out there beyond and become informed um, citizens and um, participative participatory citizens. So yeah, thinking of it in, in that context too, I think is really important. No, but I think this great, that's the, the one of the positives of, of being involved in open is the diversity of opinions. And I think the way librarians view it is slightly different to how maybe I view it. And, and I think there's real value in that because as you said, information literacy skills, they're hugely important, mm -hmm. uh, but that may not have been the thing at the top of my head. Um, so I think that that's it, that adds a real richness to, to the discussion of the community. Thanks, Ellen. And then over to you, Eamon. I'm curious what you're going to say this time now. Um, I guess I, I think everybody's and anything I was going to say has probably been already said. And I guess what what Ellen said is is very useful. But that literacy part is um, media literacy is, is is really important. I would and it's a great way to do that to engage with open data sets, open uh, resources and engage in contemporary debates, I guess, in, in an open way. Absolutely. And, and I think even the whole concept of uh, using it for assessment, so getting students to, instead of uh, disposing of, of good, uh, good assessment work that they put time and energy and research, you know, facilitating them to maybe publish this on a blog uh, so, that, so that they're actually contributing to the body of knowledge. Um, James has done this before with his students. It's a really good example. Don't know. Do you want to briefly talk about your psychology example, James? Which one? The the, the, public, the blog the one. Public guide. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, one of the assessments in um, developmental and educational psychology module is the students do a written piece on a particular educational psychology topic. But then in addition to that, they produce an infographic or a pamphlet or a poster related to that, um, that, that would inform the public about that issue. So whether it's uh, adolescent mental health or uh, resilience in schools or something like that. And then uh, the students can choose or they can opt in or out of the next piece. But then if they opt in, those pieces are publicly shared uh on what we, we do it on a on a blog but i think Catherine's told me like three different ways that we could be doing it like better but so far we just share it through a blog um and it it makes them think very differently about the knowledge that they're producing because they now feel they now know oh i'm responsible for something that's going to inform members of the public should i be doing that who does that like with the info you know who, who is responsible for information um so it it's a uh, it's them producing an OER, it's them putting something out there with a CCBY license, so they have to understand that as well. Um, so that's that's one of the things we have in, in the program that's kind of very open. Yeah, it's a nice example. Um, we're, I'll just I'll go on to the last question because because we will be running out of time. But the, the one I think uh, we're working on in a, in a different project is an open textbook. Um, so we're creating one on press books. Um, and I think that's a lovely way, again, of, sh of sharing knowledge openly. Um, and again, it's to ensure the sustainability of the knowledge of, of, of the project. So it's from the Open Teach project. Um, the final question now, what advice would you give to someone who's starting off? So we start, we go back to Catherine. Um, well, I mean, it probably makes complete sense, but just to start, small you know just to start by maybe changing one practice you know particularly if you're new to this and the fact that you're creating this community at dcu makes that ever so much easier for people in the institution because you're kind of building this community and this ethos around open so you know where that embedding in in practice isn't present you know at institutions sometimes it's harder for people to find someone who can you know, they can ask questions or so on, or, or so on. but um, start small and, you know, be inspired by examples that people use from other disciplines, from other countries, from other 
um, levels, undergraduate, postgraduate. I first started, you know, inviting my students to edit Wikipedia because I saw an example from a primary school class that was doing it in the States. And I thought, oh, I could do that with undergraduate IT students. So, and don't be afraid to make mistakes, to learn with your students, you know, just it's, we're all learning together. There's no one way to do this. Um, I think you can see that from the diversity of examples shared here today. Um, and just, you know, keep connecting with people like, you know, connect with each other, connect with me, you know, whoever, um, you know, as I said, we, we do this in community. So, and it's a lovely community. Thanks, Catherine. I, I still want to do the Wikipedia one. I, um, I really, I'm really attracted to that Women in Red project. I, I think I started one entry of a, of a women, woman, an Irish woman historian, as a, but, but somebody else finished it for me because I, I never got back to it. Um, so same question then uh, to you, James, what advice would you give? My, my answer to this is a very open answer because the, thought, the, thought, the train of thought that, that kicks off in response to this question comes from thinking done on another project about uh, encouraging people to engage in open educational practice. I'm in an EU project called uh, Open Game, which eventually will make a sort of a, an online game to encourage people into doing open educational practices, but has already, we started off making a kind of a competency framework on what problems can you solve or, or how, what kind of competency framework could you put around this idea? Um, and that was that you have to start off with the right attitude. You know, you have to want to be open. You know, once you're open to being open, that then paves the way. If people aren't, don't want to be open, if they want to be closed, then it's kind of hard for them to engage in anything else. So the, the, the first piece of advice is be open, be open to these, these practices, be open to these approaches. And after that, it's about, I would say, uh, just engage just enough with this stuff to see what problems you can solve with a small amount of openness. You know, um, you know, it, there might be an open textbook out there that is just as good as the textbook you're using and will remove any and all issues for you from now on of students saying that there aren't enough copies in the library or the there, you know, the ebook has a restrictive license on it or whatever, or that it's too expensive. You will just remove all those barriers, all those headaches by moving to that open textbook. So there's lots of examples like that. And we have some in, in our guide, um, uh, like so start small, I think that was already said, you know, you don't have to start by, you know, building a huge MOOC to somehow go along with your module. Um, but there are so many ways that you can just be a little bit open, you know, and then the next big thing is think about what you already have, what you've made just yourself, an assignment or, you know, a resource or something like that, that you could just share with others, you know, why not, you know, and put, a, put the right license on it and then just give it to other people. Shameless plug inserted, James. Shameless well plug. Never go to one event without plugging another project. <laughs> and I will, in the chat, I will share a number of links and things that people. I've already to shared them, one. James. So, but there is a very nice resource from that open game project called the Handbook of Successful Open Teaching Practices. Um, so over to you, Alan. How would you start off? Yeah. Um, well, similar to what other people have said and what James was saying there as well, think of your own practice. Um, and what you're doing and what you can easily make make open and share um, and taking those baby steps and obviously a plug for the guide but but a big plug for the library community as well is to talk to your librarians obviously as well and um, I know Ronan for example um, a member of the project team here who who worked with an academic to identify um, an open textbook for a major module actually which proved really successful and it's it's um, in the guide there particularly because we spent a lot of the last year trying to identify open resources um, where we couldn't get an ebook for um, academics and students so we've done a lot of work in that area and also just in terms of I suppose supporting them and finding it and identifying open resources that are available in the first instance that they might want to consider using but I think, as James said, just thinking about what you're creating, developing yourself and um, how you could, could share that as well, I think is important. Thanks, Ellen. Um, and that, that example from the business school is a really good one as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a nice little short information on that in the guide. Um, over to you, Eamon, how would you start? I, um, 
everybody said everything again. So uh, I just have to reuse and remix everybody, what everybody else has said. Uh, I like what James said about be open. Um, you know, it's kind of nice when they have this thing in yoga, your sankalpa, your intention that you start at the start, you know. But they say you have to do it in the present tense, I am. So I am open. So you should wake up in the morning and say, I am open. So uh, that would be my my top tip. It's a bit uh, cryptic, but you can um, make of it what you will. That's a nice philosophical way to end it, Eamon. Um, I'm just trying to think uh, the few things I did at the very start. Um, I shared infographics on Twitter that I'd made. I just stuck a license on them. Um, I uh, I put my slides online after conferences with the CC BY license. So, you know, like shared the link or put them on slide, share. Um, they were the kind of simple things. And, and even more recently, myself and James made last year this like little learning design guide, uh, just stuck a license on it and uploaded it to ResearchGate. You know, did, didn't take a huge amount of effort. I'm not even sure if people are reading it, but sure it's up there anyway. Um, so I think those little things are, 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 are where I, I started off as well. So thank you to the panel. That was really interesting. We, we have a, a few minutes now for, for a few questions. Idel is gonna, gonna field them. So if you've got questions, come in by chat or mic. We don't mind either. Um, we'll have a look at the Twitter feed as well. So yeah, Idel. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. There were some lovely comments that came through, lovely support. Uh, somebody has mentioned they're going to bookmark the library guide, so that's always a good indicator of something being useful. Um, and there were some just comments, lovely from Samantha Trafaskas around from the perspective of the student, um, how creating something real um, could help with imposter syndrome, for example, if you really have to publish something. Um, and also there was a link with Twitter, the idea, and um, Samantha, you mentioned that Twitter was an intimidating space at the beginning, but actually has created a sense of connectedness during this pandemic. Um, so there were lovely insights coming through in the comments from the students' perspective. So that was great to see. Um, it, another thing that came up earlier, Mar uh, Mark Lynn, you mentioned about academic staff not referencing images, so plagiarism occurring. And Ronan, um, you mentioned about the impact this has on students, that students are confused about sourcing images. So I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that side, but the responsibility on academic staff to um, I suppose act in a, 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 you know, the right way. That's a, that's a funny one. I've been guilty of doing that myself. I, I have tried to improve though. Um, I think that the last year has really showed people the difference between something that maybe is being produced for a classroom where it happens in a classroom and it doesn't go outside of the classroom versus when, when things are more online or when things are both online and recorded. That that you know things like copyright law around images and things becomes more uh, pressing for people to understand. As well, like that competency framework I was talking about earlier, there there is there is this kind of layer. The first layer is like knowledge for yourself, is for for the individual. You know that you know about CCBY licenses, that you know about licenses, that you know about all yours. But then the next layer is. Uh, being able to work with students to do that or facilitate them to do something, you know, so knowing yourself enough to say, oh, I know how to, I know how to turn this into an OER and put it in a repository, but then knowing how to facilitate other people in learning how to do that along with whatever other discipline work they have to do in the same module or the same, you know, in the same program and help them to do it is another kind of layer. And I think, I think Catherine wants to no, that's really thoughtful, James. And um, it's something I wish I had said before, but just that open is not a binary. Uh, you know, it's it's not like, you know, oh, today, now I'm open. Like for me, it's just this continual evolving, I, I call it continually negotiating openness. Like in different times at different points, I might open something and other times I might not. So, um, and then the other thing was just, I often think of um, open, like when someone has an open presence, you know, on the open web, it's like a pointillist portrait. So if you've been open for a long time, there's all these dots, all the things you've shared and your tweets and so on. But when you're asking someone to share openly for the first time, the first thing they share is the one dot that maybe represents them on the web. So of course it's gonna be scary and you want it to be right and all that. But I can genuinely say that like Orna said, if you share a, a presentation or something that you've done, you know, each dot that you share, each one carries less weight, you know, it doesn't have to be the best thing you've ever done. And they all form part of, you know, your open presence kind of on the web. So it really does get easier, you know, for those of you who are just starting on the path. Yeah, that's an interesting point there, Catherine, about 
the feeling exposed, people are starting to drop off the call because we've just hit 11. So we might have time for one more question from the floor. If anyone wants to jump in, any, any keen questions? I'll pause for a moment to allow that to happen if not. But if, if not, I'll start to wrap up. And firstly, can I thank all the team and the contributors today, Catherine, Ellen, Eamon, James, Edel, Victoria, Ronan, Lorraine. It's a fantastic team to work with. Um, we're going to keep going. We're going to start designing a little study around engagement. But if you'd like to, to learn more about Going Open, please reach out to any of the project team. We're very happy to chat to you about maybe how you could uh, include open practice in your teaching and learning. So thanks for your attention. I hope it's been a useful se session. Uh, and thanks for being a really interactive group. Congratulations.